Will you please rise for the reading of the scripture? Today's scripture is Matthew 5, 1 through 12. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they the mourn, that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, if they shall, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are the which are they which are persecuted for righteousness, sake for their kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they when man shall rev uh, reveal that you and persecute you and s shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for the, my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Please bow your heads and pray with me. Dear Lord, thank you for another week of your great many blessings that we forget to thank you for. There are so many things you do for us that we blindly look around and forget. I just wanted to take the time today to say thank you for those little things as well as the big things that you do for us. And in God's name we pray. Amen. Amen. I have to use a recipe because I'm such a lousy cook if I don't. <laughs> it sometimes becomes a mess. I wonder why it is that sometimes scripture sounds both beautiful and confusing at the same time. Like today's gospel reading, for example, Jesus went up on a mountain. He began to teach the disciples and those that he had called to follow him and the crowd that were curious enough to hear what Jesus might say. He started with a list of blessings, which we call the Beatitudes. The closest English word for the word that Jesus used for blessing is happy. And that's how some translations read it. Happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Using the word happy makes things even more confusing because we don't usually equate the word happy with poor in spirit or happy with those who mourn or with those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Which is it then we might want to ask, blessed or happy, because those two words don't seem synonymous either. Jesus defined happiness or being blessed in a radically different way than what the disciples expected and certainly differently than what we normally expect to be blessed or to be happy in this context means that we find joy and wholeness in knowing who Jesus is and in following his teaching to the very best of our ability even in the midst of sorrow even in the midst of hardship even in the midst of persecution perhaps even because of these things maybe even because of these things how is it that in the grief share class while those of us who are participating in that have seen the very depths of those who mourn we also have seen the very depths of the joy of Jesus Christ among those who are there together Living into the Beatitudes is a very tall order, and believers often approach them as an impossible challenge for ordinary living. Who could measure up except for the greatest of saints 
who come along from time to time. A guy named Charles James Cook suggests that living daily into the spirit of the Beatitudes involves looking at them as a collection of the whole rather than looking at each one individually. Because each of these Beatitudes is related to the others, they build on one another. Those who are meek, meaning humble, are more likely to thirst for righteousness. And because they remain open to the presence and knowledge of God, because of that hunger for righteousness, they seek to make peace or they are quicker to extend mercy. Am I making sense there? They, they build on each other. A person may not excel at all of the Beatitudes all of the time, yet still strive to live into each of them as faithfully as possible. <clears throat> Cook says there are three principles for living into the spirit of the Beatitudes. There, those are simplicity, hopefulness, and compassion. If you're going to live into these Beatitudes, then you need to be simple, simplicity, you need to have hopefulness, and you need to have compassion. To approach the Beatitudes simply is to hear the words clearly, without prejudice, and to know that the words truly are meant for everyone, including us. We do receive more courage than fear when we hear Jesus saying, you are blessed in this life whenever you demonstrate humility, bring a peaceful presence, open your heart to others, or show mercy on those who cry for it. I'm going to repeat that because I think it's important. You are blessed in this life whenever you demonstrate humility, when you are humble in spirit, when you don't have to know it all, when you don't act like you know it all, when you are ready to hear what somebody else has to say, you are blessed when you bring a peaceful presence, when you're not ready to fight about everything, when you can wait for just a moment before you lash out, when you open your heart to others, or when you show mercy on those who cry for it. You are blessed. Simplicity doesn't mean that the message has been watered down. Rather, simplicity means that the message has been distilled to a point that it can be understood by everyone. The Living Application Bible adds these notes to the Beatitudes. It says, you cannot hunger and thirst for righteousness if you proudly think of yourself as already righteous. Oh my. <laughs> that, that speaks volumes, doesn't it? Right there. It, it makes me think that I have to let go of that righteous button and be aware that perhaps, maybe, I don't already know it all, and I have to be open to what somebody else has to say. You cannot be merciful with, without recognizing your own need for mercy. You cannot be a peacemaker if you believe that you are always right. Oh my gosh. We could spend a whole season on that one, couldn't we? In simple terms, in order to live into the Beatitudes, a person has to move from a self-centered life to a Christ-centered life. There are several characteristics that are unique to Christianity, among which is hopefulness. Of all of the uh, world religions, of all the world religions, the one thing that may be central to Christianity, unique to Christianity, is hopefulness. The second principle Cook mentioned, necessary to practice the Beatitudes, a key theme throughout the Old and New Testaments is hope, a trust that this is not all there is, that God keeps God's promises, that no matter what our present circumstance, 
God is working things out for good. No matter how bleak it looks, no matter how broken it is, no matter that God is in the midst of it and God is working something out. German theologian Jürgen Moltmann stated that the death knell of the church is when the overall attitude moves from anger to cynicism. It is possible to have a righteous anger about something which leaves room for the possibility of change. Cynicism, on the other hand, accepts what is, regardless of the consequences, and with no hope that things will get better. Cynicism says, this is it, get used to it. And hopefulness leaves open the possibility that the day will come when mercy, humility, peace, and love are the descriptions of what it means to truly live. Your faces are so serious right this moment. <laughs> and I know what I said is so serious. But my friends, I'm telling you, we have to fight against the temptation to become cynical. Amen. We have to fight against it because in every area of our lives, there are things that beat upon us to say, this is all there is. This is the best it's ever going to be. There is never going to be any change. And I'm here to tell you that hope is something that God gives to us. It is a spark within us. It is as true and as dear and as important as life itself and we cannot bear for that light to be snuffed out amen. please let me hear an amen. Amen. amen the third principle of the beatitude living is compassion compassion is neither pity nor sympathy pity is when a person feels sorry for someone else Pity is when you feel sorry for someone else. And sympathy means that you understand what another person is experiencing and is willing to lend a listening ear or a helping hand. But compassion, compassion is the willingness or the ability to walk in someone else's shoes and recognizing that we are all created in God's image and that we are family because of our humanity. That is what compassion is. That, that, means that, that means that we are able to see that we don't have to feel sorry for someone else, but that we can recognize that we all, either we all get there or none of us get there. We are either all free or none of us are free. We are all safe or none of us are safe. That is what compassion says. A young employee stole several hundred dollars of his employer's money when the theft came to light, he was ordered to report to the senior partner of the firm. He knew he was going to lose his job. He was afraid that he would be arrested or worse. His world came crashing in around him. Once in the boss's office, the boss asked him if it was true, if the charges were true, and the young man confessed that, yes, he had, in fact, taken the money. And then came the unexpected question. If I keep you in your present capacity, can I trust you in the future? And shocked, the young employee replied, yes, sir, you surely can. I've learned my lesson. And the boss responded, okay, 
I'm not going to press charges. You still have your job. And the young man was totally shocked. He did not know what to think. The boss said, I think you need to know that you are the second person in this firm who has succumbed to temptation. I was the first. And the mercy that you are receiving, I received. It is only the grace of God that can keep us both. In most circumstances, the young employee would not only have been fired, but the employer would take legal action as well. It is truly a reversal of expectations, a redefinition of blessed or happy to treat a thief with mercy and to be humble enough to admit one's own mistakes or shortcomings. I don't think we can be healed until we are humble enough that we can admit our own mistakes or shortcomings. I think shame is a fierce taskmaster. I think it keeps us bound in ways that are cruel and horrifying. And I'm not suggesting that you tell everything about yourself to everybody, but I will say that when someone has earned the right to hear your story, that it is a freeing thing to be humble enough to tell them so that you are no longer bound by what it is that holds you captive. Perhaps after all, this passage is not so confusing if we look at it simply, hopefully, and with compassion. Often children see things with a clarity that is wise beyond their years. One Sunday morning, a, a mother and her daughter drove home after church. The girl turned to her mother and said, Mommy, there's something about what the preacher said this morning that I didn't understand. Well, what was that? The mother said. Well, the preacher said that God is bigger than we are, that God is so big that God could hold the whole world in God's hand. Is that true? Yes, that's true, honey. But, but mommy, the preacher also said that God comes to live inside of us when we believe as Jesus is our Savior. Is that true too? And again, the mother assured the little girl that what the pastor had said was true. And with a puzzled look on her face, the girl then asked, if God is bigger than us and God lives in us, wouldn't God show through? <laughs> My friends, that is what the Beatitudes are all about. Living in such a way that God shows through us. Simply, with hopefulness, with compassion. It doesn't matter what other people think. It matters how we live. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.